Robert F. Stroud is popularly known as the Birdman of Alcatraz, but he never had birds on Alcatraz. Frequently during my early years on the rock, I heard of Bob Stroud. I was later to meet him personally. In order to understand Stroud, you have to know his history. In 1909, Robert Stroud was convicted of robbing and killing a bartender in Juneau, Alaska. According to the police, Stroud had been a thorn in their side for a very long time. He had been pimping prostitutes and had been in and out of jails. Since Alaska did not have a territorial prison, Stroud was sent to the United States Penitentiary at McNeil Island, Washington. While at McNeil Island, he assaulted a hospital orderly because the man refused to give him drugs. Six months was tacked onto his time, and he was transferred to Leavenworth. He settled down to serve his sentence. Leavenworth at this time was a pretty tough prison, with none of the present-day amenities, such as college classes, extensive recreation programs, libraries, outside newspapers, and so on. Nevertheless, Bob Stroud made a fairly good adjustment. The one thing that he had to look forward to was his occasional visits from Alaska of his mother. During his stay in Leavenworth, Stroud somehow or other alienated a prison guard. The guard harassed Stroud on every occasion. His mother wrote that she was going to visit. A day prior to the visit, the guard wrote a disciplinary report for a minor infraction. By writing this report, the guard could effectively prevent Stroud from having his visit. The morning before the visit, Stroud approached the guard as he entered the dining room and politely requested that the disciplinary report not be turned in because his mother would be visiting. The guard laughed and said he didn't care how far she had come. He, Stroud, wouldn't see her. A friend had advised him that a inf minor infraction of the rules would not negate his seeing his mother. At breakfast that morning, the guard entered the dining room. Stroud again tried to approach him, and the guard told him that by approaching him, leaving the line without permission, he now had another disciplinary report. This dining room was not the type of dining room that you see in Leavenworth today with its four men tables and variegated plastic and steel metal chairs. The men sat at that time sat in long rows with the convicts leaning against the front of the tables behind them. Their seats were hinge seats which sprung up when not in use. All of the men faced the front of the dining room. Two rules governed the dining room at Leavenworth at this time. No talking, and a man must eat everything on his tray. Stroud was upset because he was fearful that he was not going to see his mother. He did not eat everything on the tray. The guard who did not like Stroud counted the silver at the end of each row of tables and observed the trays to be sure that everything had been eaten. There was still some stewed fruit in Bob's tray. The, guy smi the guard smiled at him and called down the row to let him know that he was again on report. A convict in front of Stroud, who was supposed to have been a friend, nudged Stroud's knee. Stroud reached down and found a prison-made shiv, or knife, in his hand. Most prison shivs are made of kitchen knives or other pieces of metal, honed down to a sharp point, and the handle is usually wrapped with electric tape to ensure a firmer grip. Bob hid the knife inside of his pants and shirt. On the way out of the dining room, he approached the guard to plead for a break. The guard told him again that by stepping out of line and speaking without permission, he had another report. Enraged, Stroud reached inside of his shirt and pulled out the knife. 
in front of over a thousand convicts and gods, he stabbed the guard to death. His conviction was a foregone conclusion. The court saw no mitigating circumstances. His mother had remained for the trial. Stroud was sentenced to be hanged at the Kansas State Prison at Lansing on April 23, 1920. Stroud's mother traveled to Washington, where she met with President Woodrow Wilson's wife and pleaded as one mother to another for the life of her son. Through the intervention of Mrs. Wilson, Stroud's sentence was computed, commuted on April 15, eight days before his scheduled execution, to life imprisonment in solitary confinement. He was housed in 63 Building in Leavenworth, the isolation segregation building. He developed an interest in birds and secured permission to have a couple of canaries sent in to him. Before he left for Alcatraz in 1942, he would accumulate almost 300 birds. He began to breed the birds and send them out of the prison to be sold. During his time in prison, Stroud wrote two books, Diseases of Canaries and Stroud's Digest on the Diseases of Birds, books which ornithologists and breeders considered definitive works and valuable to poultrymen. On December 19, 1942, Stroud was transferred to Alcatraz after the officials allegedly discovered that he was using the bottom of the bird cages to send unauthorized letters out of the prison. They also claimed they found a small still in his cell as well as a dagger. Stroud told me that his transfer was affected by one of the United States Parole Board members and the director of the Bureau of Prisons because they demanded part of the revenue from his bird sales. This allegation seems a bit unlikely to me. Although he probably made a good deal of money for a convict, it seems improbable that these officials would have placed themselves in such a position. Who knows who is right? When Stroud arrived on Alcatraz, he was locked up in D-Block, the prison's isolation segregation unit. He spent better than 10 years in the unit, never leaving his cell excepting one day a week to shower. After developing a kidney problem, he was transferred to the hospital above the dining room. Here he was kept in a cell which had a wooden door with an observation window and an inner barred meshed steel door with a slot in it for his food tray. The hospital room was very spacious compared to the small D-block cell. He had a narrow cot, a sink, a toilet, a straight back wooden chair, and a table. From the barred window, Bod had a, Bod had a spectacular view of the Golden Gate Bridge and the ship traffic passing in and out of the bay. It was in 1958 that I met Stroud. President John F. Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy had reviewed the Stroud case. The public was becoming more aware of him. Burt Lancaster, the actor, and Senator Long of Missouri asked that his case be reviewed with the view of possibly paroling him. Psychiatrists from Letterman Army General Hospital in San Francisco came over and interviewed him, and they came to the conclusion that he still had a violent temper and would be a danger if released into society. He had spent over 40 years in solitary confinement. The Kennedys questioned the constitutionality of the solitary confinement provision of the sentence and determined to transfer him to the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners at Springfield, Missouri. The director of the Bureau of Prisons, James V. Bennett, was in accord, fearful of what Stroud's death on Alcatraz might do to the public's perception of the Bureau of Prisons. He was let out on the main yard of the prison in the morning, when no one else was using it, in order to build his strength 
for the arduous trip. One day, I stayed in for my industry's assignment for a dental call. After I had seen the dentist, I was let out in the yard to wait for a guard to come up to let me off of the yard down into the industry's work area. This little, desiccated old man with steel-rimmed glasses watched me descend into the yard. He broke into a smile and hurried up to me, offering me his hand. I'm Bob Stroud. Who are you? I'm Frank Hatfield. One question followed another. How long had I been on Alcatraz? When would I be getting out? As we strolled back and forth in the yard, I got to know Bob better. At the time we spoke, he was beginning to study st Sanskrit. But he never spent much time on one subject because his studies usually led into other fields, which were more intriguing. He told me that he knew that the government would never let him out and that he would die in prison. He said that he would have liked to have gone out for a while, but the government, and especially James V. Bennett, director of the Bureau of Prisons, would not want him to have access to the press. He said that he had written and rewritten his memoirs and that Bennett had had the material confiscated and destroyed. Stroud said that he knew of corruption in the Bureau of Prisons and wanted to expose it, but that they would never let him. Within an hour, a guard came up from the industries to the yard's heavy steel door, unlocked it, and let me through. I would see Bob Stroud two more times in the yard, where we nurtured our new friendship. Being a good listener was important, because Stroud needed to talk. He was angry. He felt that prison officials were out to get him. He was especially angry about the fact that his window, the clear window panes, had been replaced a year earlier with thick, opaque glass bricks, destroying his view of the bay. The officials claimed that the sea air had eroded the window frames and they had to make the change. It was years later, in 1975, that I discovered that many of the windows had been replaced in other rooms with clear glass bricks, which still gave a view of the bay. They could have given him that last little bit, his only window to the outside world. Robert Stroud had sinned, but he had paid a dreadful price, isolation from his fellow man. He was trapped by his anger and his inability to cope with the rules and conventions of a free society. After his transfer to the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, I heard from him once. A new prisoner on the island told me that when Stroud had arrived at the Medical Center, he was a bit of a celebrity and had been given a room of his own with a television set. Stroud would sit in his room watching TV, but he would get up every few minutes and go to the door and open it, glance up and down the hallway, and then close it softly. For the first time in over 40 years, he could control in a limited sense his comings and goings. Bob was a complex man with a lot of hate, a man who in his own little way gave breeders a better understanding of bird disease through his books. In part, he paid his debt for the lives that he had taken. He could never pay in full for the lives shortened so violently by his hand. In 1963, he died quietly in his sleep at the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners.